Despite winning numerous awards in a seven-decade career, Julie Andrews, nearing the age of 90, has shared her somber life story. A tale that has deeply saddened fans. Stay till the end of this video to learn all about her life. Early Life Julie Andrews was born on October 1, 1935 in England. She would live a long life. Today she's almost 90, and how she lives is sad. But she has cherished vivid memories of her father, Edward Charles Wells, from her early days. Her original name was Julia Elizabeth Wells, after her true father, but her last name would be later changed to Andrews. Edward Charles Wells treated Julie and her siblings as cherished companions, never belittling or talking down to them. Throughout their childhood, he immersed them in the wonders of nature. One early memory for Julie was when her father took her outside to observe a large ant's nest he discovered while gardening. Reflecting on her parents, Julie once faced a provocative question about which parent she hated the most. This made her realize that she loved her father with all her being. While her mother held immense importance, Julie felt a deeper trust in her father. But sadly, Julie wouldn't spend much of her childhood with her father. In September 1939, World War II erupted, with Hitler focusing on invading Poland and later in the spring of 1940 targeting Norway and Denmark. This period, termed the Phony War, saw a formal declaration of war between Germany and the European allies, yet neither side initiated significant attacks. England had a brief window to bolster its defenses before the German advance, as the United States had not entered the conflict, England worked independently to prepare for defense. Julie Andrews' father, valued for his engineering skills, was deemed essential to the home defense effort and was exempted from combat. Instead, he joined the Home Guard. During the wartime struggles, Julie's parents grew distant, leading to changes in her living arrangements. Initially, she resided with her father, Edward Charles Wells, until the age of five. But she then reluctantly moved to live with her mother and stepfather, Ted Andrews, in London. Ted Andrews, an entertainer and his wife, contributed to entertaining troops during World War II. While Edward Charles had custody of both Johnny and Julie Andrews, and had the option to contest it, he chose not to. The reasons for this decision were unclear, perhaps influenced by a belief that a little girl needed her mother or financial constraints preventing him from keeping both children. Regardless, Julie went with her mother, and her brother Johnny remained with Edward Charles. Adolescence proved challenging for Julie as the family struggled financially, living in a slum area of London. This period was referred to as a black chapter in her life. The apartment where they lived was dimly lit, lacking color, and Ted Andrews became a new presence in Julie's life, a shadow that she wasn't fond of. She sought to ignore his existence, focusing solely on her mother and their genetic connection in an attempt to exclude Ted from her reality. However, her efforts to make him disappear were unsuccessful. Ted Andrews, having been the black sheep of his family, endured a difficult and abusive childhood. He seemed uneasy around Julie and his attempts to connect with her were met with shyness or outright mocking on her part. The strained relationship and Julie's attempts to distance herself showcase the uncomfortable early days of Julie's childhood. But the war would cause even more trouble in her life. Wartime trouble. The impact of the war became vivid for Julie Andrews, as air raid sirens frequently wailed, especially after dark. The warden enforced blackout measures rigorously, demanding darkness even through the smallest chink in the blackout curtains. The basement room was her shelter, where she prayed for her mother's safety in the flat above. Escalating bombing raids often required them to seek refuge in underground stations, joining the masses doing the same. Amid the raids, the ominous crunch of bombs demolishing buildings occasionally echoed. During one air raid, her mother and stepfather, Ted, returned late from an entertaining engagement. The warden, knocking on every door, said that an incendiary bomb had been dropped, but these bombs do not always explode immediately, and this particular one couldn't be located in the darkness of the night. Evacuation was advised, but Julie's mother and stepfather chose not to respond because they were exhausted. They likely were the only ones remaining in the building and, fatigued, quietly went to bed. 
The following morning, upon pulling back the blackout curtains, Julie's mother was startled to find the incendiary bomb settled in the courtyard's concrete square. They had unknowingly slept beside it all night. This period of history was devastating for the masses. From September 1940 to May 1941, Germany's Luftwaffe subjected strategic targets in the UK to extensive bombing raids known as the Blitz. This included the very same London that Julie was residing in during her childhood. This period of intense attacks led to the evacuation of many children to the English countryside. For those who remained, bomb shelters provided crucial safety. But the Blitz was a time of terror, food shortages, and rationing. By the end of this devastating period, approximately 43,000 people had lost their lives, and over a million structures were damaged or destroyed. The Germans unleashed pilotless aircraft, referred to as doodlebugs, on England. The family would hear the pulsating drone of their approach, followed by sudden silence as the engine cut out, and an unforgettable whistling sound marked the missile hurtling toward the earth. Facing relentless raids, they often sought refuge in the air raid shelter, enduring nights of quiet chats, listening for airplanes, huddling in a claustrophobic space, wondering if that day would be the one they were hit. Fortunately, the bombs tended to fall in a circle around them. The start of singing. In the spring of 1943, Ted Andrews, Julie Andrews' stepfather, decided to provide her with singing lessons. To their surprise, they discovered that her singing voice was quite unique, possessing phenomenal range and strength, uncommon at such a young age. Around the same time, Julie's parents finalized their divorce, and her mother and Ted promptly married in a civil ceremony on November 25th of the same year. Shortly afterward, Julie's mother suggested finding an appropriate name for her to call Ted, who had been addressed as Uncle Ted by Julie so far. Although Julie didn't appreciate the conversation, her mother proposed Pop, a name Julie disliked but eventually accepted. Thus, Ted became Pop from that point forward, despite Julie's initial reservations. At the same time, Julie's name underwent an official change from Julia Elizabeth Wells to Julie Andrews. Around the age of 10, in 1945, Julie began joining her mother and stepfather on stage, sometimes performing solo. To support her family, she had to perform up to two shows per evening in venues filled with smoke and alcohol. Julie, despite these challenges, also took on the responsibility of helping raise her younger siblings. Attempting to brighten up gloomy dressing rooms with flowers, she brought some light to her dark situation. As her mother and stepfather's careers improved, the family's circumstances changed and they moved to a better situation in Hersham. But her relationship with her stepfather would take a turn for the worse. Her troubled relationship with her stepfather. One of the most challenging experiences in Julie Andrews' youth occurred when she was 15 years old, as she recounts in her memoir, Home. During this time, her stepfather, Ted Andrews, behaved inappropriately toward his teenage stepdaughter while under the influence of alcohol. Julie describes the encounter as deeply distressing, prompting her to secure her door with a lock to establish a sense of safety and privacy, thanks to her aunt's help. Ted would make another inappropriate attempt, but was unable to due to the installed lock. Perplexed, he questioned why the lock had been added. Julie, avoiding the full truth, emphasized her need for privacy stating that the lock made her feel more secure. This incident wasn't the first time Ted Andrews had acted inappropriately towards his stepdaughter. Another incident occurred when Julie was merely nine years old. She later wrote in her book that something about the situation felt wrong. When Julie's mother learned of the incident with Ted Andrews, she never discussed it with Julie, but tensions escalated between her mother and her stepfather creating a strained atmosphere and an icy coldness between her parents. This incident understandably destroyed Julie's relationship with her stepfather. While Ted Andrews wouldn't show any more inappropriate behavior, the damage was done, and Julie tried to keep herself as far away from him as possible. Alcoholic Parents Amidst the wartime stress and fear and the additional trauma of her stepfather, Julie Andrews endured additional challenges as both her mother and stepfather struggled with alcoholism, leading to an abusive environment. Eventually, her stepfather adopted her, 
and together they performed on stage, entertaining troops during the war. In a pivotal moment, Julie sang for Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother to Queen Elizabeth II, after her coronation. After the performance for the Queen Mother, Julie experienced a taste of celebrity when she was complimented on her singing. However, the joy of this moment was short-lived. Around the same time, her maternal grandparents succumbed to syphilis, a disease her grandfather passed on to her grandmother. Reflecting on her mother's struggles, Julie would say that her grandfather too was an alcoholic and abusive towards her mother, which is why Julie thinks her mother picked Ted Andrews to be her husband, a man Julie regards as abusive. Her stepfather's descent into alcoholism accelerated throughout her life, marked by worsening benders and occasional attempts at sobriety. His remorseful periods would lead him to seek treatment, but the relief was always temporary. Life at home remained tense and unpleasant, resuming its difficult rhythm upon his return. Despite occasional periods of sobriety, his true alcoholic nature inevitably led to relapses. Initially, Julie's mother didn't frequent the pub, but as her stepfather's struggles persisted, she joined him, eventually succumbing to alcoholism herself. Julie believed her mother's descent into alcoholism stemmed from a sense of helpless rage, likely inherited from her own father. The combination of their alcohol-related struggles made life exceedingly challenging for the family, especially for the parents. Julie's parents continued to engage in frequent fights, fueled by their struggles with alcohol. Julie could sense an aura of estrangement between her parents, leading to them eventually occupying separate rooms. Ted Andrews slept at one end of the house, while Julie's mother had a room next to her. But on the bright side, Julie Andrews, known as the pigtailed prodigy, began working professionally and contributed money to support her family. In 1946, she showcased her talent on British radio alongside Ted Andrews. At the age of 12, she made her debut in London's West End. A notable achievement during her early years was singing Mignon for King George VI at the London Palladium, making her the youngest performer to appear at a Royal Command performance. In the 1950s, Julie made regular TV appearances. However, her big screen career had to wait. The London office of Hollywood studio Metro Goldwyn Mayer conducted a screen test, but chose not to sign her. Despite this setback, Julie Andrews stayed busy during her teenage years, performing in holiday season pantomimes or pantos. Her roles included characters like Little Red Riding Hood, as well as parts in Aladdin and Jack and the Beanstalk. Alongside these roles, Julie performed solo and with her parents. Her demanding schedule prevented her from completing high school or attending college. Her real father. Julie Andrews experienced another shocking revelation about her real father at the age of 14. She loved her father, Edward Charles, but little did she know he wasn't her biological father. Her mother brought her to a social engagement where she was introduced to a man, supposedly her biological father. She felt intrigued by the man, as if there was some sort of connection between the two she couldn't explain. He asked her questions, showing his genuine interest in her. On the way back home from the party, Julie's mother told her the truth, that Edward Wells was not her true father. It was instead the man she met at the party. This revelation came as a shock to Julie, saying defensively that it didn't make a difference because Edward was the one she'd always recognize as her real father the man that raised her, the one that she loved truly. But she still couldn't shake the dreadful feeling that this revelation gave her. Julie has never disclosed the name of her true biological father, maintaining a deep respect for Edward Charles Wells, who had raised her. Reflecting on that time, Julie later mentioned that she only met her biological father twice and corresponded with him a few times throughout her life. Uncertain if he knew about their relationship, she refrained from discussing it, fearing the potential harm it might cause. The ambiguity, coupled with her mother's later struggles with mental health and depression, instilled a fear in Julie that she, too, might experience a breakdown. At the age of 14, she began hearing voices in her head at night, making her very concerned about her own mental well-being. Despite his faults, Julie Andrews' stepfather recognized her talent and provided her with voice tutors and coaches. Madame Lillian Stiles Allen became a significant influence, 
and although Julie shied away from the praise, she acknowledged her clear four-octave range. From her humble beginnings on stage with her parents, Julie Andrews progressed to numerous performances, marking her Broadway debut in The Boyfriend in 1954. She then secured the coveted role of Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady, originating the character. In 1957, she played the titular character in the live broadcast of Cinderella, a pivotal early television role. Her film career took off in 1964 with the iconic Mary Poppins, earning her an Oscar and a Golden Globe. However, around this time, Julie faced disappointment when she passed over for the film adaptation of My Fair Lady, a role given to Audrey Hepburn, who needed her vocal parts dubbed by ghost singer Marnie Nixon. Despite feeling slighted, Julie later expressed gratitude as it allowed her to star in the beloved Disney classic The Sound of Music in 1965, her unhappy marriage. Fast forward into the future, Julie Andrews experienced two significant loves in her life. Her first husband was set designer Tony Walton, and their union lasted for nine years. Julie and Walton, both teenagers with a shared interest in theater, first connected when Walton saw her on stage in a 1948 performance of Humpty Dumpty at the George Hotel in Luton. At the ages of 11 and 12, they became pen pals, nurturing a friendship. Eleven years later, their engagement transpired quietly during dinner at the Walton family home. Julie recalled the moment, stating that they looked at each other, smiled, and one of them whispered that they should get married soon. On May 10, 1959, Julie Andrews and Tony Walton exchanged vows. This marriage seeped into their professional life, too. Around this time, Disney enlisted Julie for the lead role in Mary Poppins and Walton played a role by creating costumes for the renowned musical film. Their daughter, Emma Walton Hamilton, entered the world on November 27, 1962. However, the challenges of parenthood, combined with the demands of fame and success, strained the marriage. Reflecting on that period, Julie acknowledged the difficulties, stating that being a mother made it tough to balance love for her husband and understanding his perspective while also wanting her kids to be content. The situation pulled her in many emotional directions. The strain eventually led to their divorce in 1969. Julie shared her feelings, expressing sorrow over the separation from her first husband and recognizing the inevitability of their parting. In a conversation with Stephen Colbert on The Late Show, she described the aftermath of the divorce, stating that her mind was cluttered with distressing thoughts. Discussing the emotional toll, Julie admitted that the experience made her feel like a failure, as divorce was not something she had anticipated when entering the marriage. In a 2019 interview, she conveyed a sense of self-blame, stating that she felt she had failed and took responsibility for a significant portion of it, although recognized that both played a role. Although Walton remarried Jen Leroy Walton in 1991, he and Julie maintained a strong friendship and continued to collaborate professionally. Following Walton's death on March 2, 2022, Julie paid tribute to him, expressing that he was her dearest and oldest friend who taught her to see the world with fresh eyes, and she would miss him greatly. Regarded as a titan of the arts, Tony Walton, Julie's ex-husband, was remembered as a devoted father and husband, deeply cherished by many, including Julie her her tragic second marriage. Julie found love again with director Blake Edwards, whom she married in 1969. Their enduring marriage lasted over four decades until Edwards' passing in 2010. Reflecting on the success of their long marriage, Julie emphasized the approach of taking it one day at a time, as shared in a 2015 interview. She marveled at the fact that 41 years later, they were still together. Julie's most enduring love was with Edwards, whom she initially encountered in 1959, describing their first meeting as ships passing at night at some event. They officially connected years later when they coincidentally drove in opposite directions from the therapist's office. Recalling the moment, she mentioned Edwards rolling down the window, smiling and asking if she was heading where he had just come from, acknowledging the corniness of the situation. Their closeness deepened during the production of the 1969 musical Darling Lily, directed by Edwards. 
Reflecting on their love, Edwards admitted that it seemed dumb not to acknowledge they were in love. During the early stages of their relationship, both were still in the process of divorcing their former spouses, Julie from Walton and Edwards from Patricia Walker. The first proposal from Edwards took Julie by surprise, coming only a little over a year into their relationship. Julie, in her book, expressed her shock, noting that neither of them had finalized their divorce at that point. Recalling those early days of their romance, Julie shared that it took about three years before they officially tied the knot, but they had already formed a strong bond. In an interview, she described Edwards as the most charismatic and interesting fellow she had ever met, expressing doubt that she would find anyone quite like him. According to her, he was unbelievably terrific. In 1969, Julie and Blake officially became a married couple. Blake, the director of breakfast at Tiffany's, brought two stepchildren from his prior marriage, Jeffrey Edwards and Jennifer Edwards, into their new family. The couple also expanded their family by adopting two daughters, Amy Edwards and Joanna Edwards, from Vietnam. Living a life of luxury, they divided their time between homes in Gstaad, Switzerland, and Malibu, California. Blake Edwards acknowledged Julie during his acceptance of an honorary Oscar in 2004, expressing gratitude to everyone who contributed to that moment, including friends and foes. Throughout the years, Julie shared her sentimental thoughts about her husband. She marveled at their 37 years of marriage back in 2007, expressing amazement at how quickly time had passed. She mentioned Blake's exceptional directing skills and humor, stating that her admiration for him was not solely because of their marriage. Her happy marriage with Blake makes what comes next even sadder. Tragically, Blake Edwards succumbed to pneumonia in 2010, with Julie at his side. Reflecting on his unique qualities, she said that she hasn't met anyone with his level of wit and sophistication. Even all the way in 2015, Julie admitted to still grappling with Blake's death. She described the unpredictable nature of grief, acknowledging days when everything feels fine and others when the loss hits hard. Despite the pain, she believed that Blake's love endured in her heart. Expressing the depth of her feelings, Julie mentioned the ongoing presence of their love. She described their 41-year marriage as a love story, and the only reason the two got so far was by taking it one step at a time. She still misses him dearly. Before we move on, it's time for today's subscriber pick. Julie Andrews is now almost 90, and how she lives is sad. She would appear in many interviews divulging her successes, regrets, and joys in life, but not all of them have been available to the public. One of our subscribers shared a photo from one of these lost interviews, where Julie finally revealed the greatest tragedy that had happened to her in her life, a tragedy which wasn't even mentioned in her memoir. But we don't know what the story is. So this is where you, the viewer, come in. Comment down below if you know anything about Julie Andrews' hidden tragedy. Why is it being kept a secret? Remember to use the hashtag subscriberpick to let us know your answers. Now, let's move on to the next part of Julie's story. She lost her singing voice. Julie Andrews is celebrated for her extraordinary singing voice that has been showcased in iconic films like Mary Poppins and The Sound of Music. But this very singing voice would be in trouble in 1997, when she encountered vocal issues during her Broadway stint in Victor Victoria. Diagnosed with a vocal cord lesion, described by some reports as non-cancerous nodules or a benign polyp, Julie decided to undergo surgery to fix the issue. Given an opportunity to rest her voice after concluding her Broadway run, the production team, including her husband Blake Edwards, proposed joining a touring production of Victor Victoria. Despite her vocal concerns, the team believed in her participation. So, in order to participate in the tour, in June 1997, Julie underwent vocal cord surgery at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, expecting a swift recovery that would allow her to sing again within weeks. However, the surgery took an unexpected turn. While the initial intention was to remove the lesion without compromising her singing ability, the procedure left her unable to sing. The operation, which involved techniques like forceps or lasers common in the 1990s, carried a significant risk of scarring the vocal cords. In Julie's case, the surgery led to an unfortunate outcome, 
destroying her capacity to sing. The human voice relies on the vibrations of the vocal cords for both speech and singing. Excessive strain on the vocal cords, often experienced by singers pushing their limits, can result in benign growths like cysts, nodules, or polyps. While these growths can be removed, the surgical techniques of that era posed a considerable risk of scarring. For Julie, a performer known for her voice, the surgery meant confronting a devastating loss. The surgery not only failed to address the initial issue effectively, but also took away her ability to express herself through singing. After undergoing surgery, Julie Andrews experienced a decline in her singing ability due to scarred vocal cords. The operation left her with vocal cords that were no longer as flexible, resulting in a hoarse speaking voice and the loss of her clear four-octave singing range. Her husband, Blake Edwards, expressed his belief in a 1998 interview that she might not sing again. The situation was a tragedy. In response to this, Julie initiated legal proceedings in December 1999. She filed a lawsuit against her doctors and Mount Sinai, alleging that she had not been adequately informed of the risks associated with the surgery. The lawsuit argued that the surgery had not been necessary and that its outcome had devastated her singing ability, hindering her professional musical career. A confidential settlement was reached in the next year, but Julie wouldn't give up. Following the surgery, Julie attempted to reclaim her voice through vocal exercises. Multiple surgeries conducted by Dr. Steven Zeitels aimed to remove some scar tissue and improve the flexibility of the remaining vocal tissue. Although these efforts enhanced the quality of her speaking voice, they proved insufficient to restore her singing voice fully. Zeitels determined that a considerable portion of Julie's vocal cord tissue was irreversibly lost, making the revival of her singing voice an unattainable goal. As of 2015, Julie acknowledged that her vocal range was limited to approximately one octave, with low notes within reach but middle and high notes out of her range. The world lost a beautiful voice on the day of her surgery. Coming to terms with her loss, Julie has sought innovative treatments for vocal cord issues. For this purpose, she has actively contributed to research funding, organized a vocal cord symposium, and served as an honorary chair for the Voice Health Institute. She has channeled resources into exploring potential breakthroughs, such as a biogel that, when injected into the vocal cords, could temporarily enhance pliability. Despite these efforts, time-consuming testing and trials have prevented the availability of a viable solution so far. Coming to terms with the inability to sing as she once did proved challenging for Julie. Singing was a lifelong passion cultivated since childhood. It held immense significance for her, especially on stage. In her memoir, she expressed the profound joy of being enveloped by the orchestra's swell and the perfect harmony of melody and lyrics. However, the unexpected turn of events left her voice altered, which caused a period of emotional difficulty. In 1999, Andrews sought grief therapy at an Arizona clinic. She also acknowledged to Barbara Walters in an interview that she was in denial, and if she were to accept that she has lost her ability to communicate through her voice, it would be devastating. Despite a sense of denial initially, she eventually mustered the courage to perform in public and on film adapting to her changed vocal range for the song in 2004's The Princess Diaries 2 Royal Engagement. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.